Welcome and thanks for joining me. My guest today is Levi Gundert. He's the Senior Vice President of Global Intelligence at Recorded Future. And Levi, the topic today is looking for threats through data monitoring. And this is an activity that every agency at one level or another is going through, whether it's cybersecurity threats, it could be mission related, such as national security threats or threats to the domestic homeland, you name it. And so it's a moving target, how to go about this and making sure that you are monitoring all the data that you need to monitor to make sure that you are on top of whatever the threat is. So let's, let's start at the top. Your best advice for keeping these efforts fully functioning in terms of data sources, uh, making sure that what agencies are monitoring, monitoring for is going to give them the answers they hope to find or prevent. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to be here today, Tom. It's, it's great to be here. And I think, you know, we're obviously living in a time where technology plays such a large role uh, in everyone's lives and, and especially for law enforcement, whether at the local, the state or the, the federal level, there is so much information and so much data uh, to consume. And when you think about sort of the mission of law enforcement and, and what they're there to do, um, whether, you, as you said, whether you're talking about, you know, terrorist threats or, or physical threats, uh, all the way down to, you know, protecting our economy uh, from, from cyber crime and everything in between, there is just an enormous amount of data that has to be uh, collected and processed and analyzed. And the fact of the matter is that it's, it's basically impossible to do that at scale without some pretty significant technology, you know, brought to bear on that problem. And this is also a highly regulated area because there are legal restrictions on what people can monitor for, what agencies can monitor for, what practitioners can go after. Let's talk about law enforcement as an example. Law enforcement does do a lot. That's a major function of law enforcement is data collection. And aside from their own activities, arrests, what happens during arrests, the types of cases that come up, there is a lot more they can avail themselves to, to be able to prevent crime or to see trends in crime. So what, what are the use cases for data monitoring beyond the generation of their own case-based data? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I was fortunate to, to formally be with the U.S. Secret Service where I was a, an agent and I, I worked out of the Los Angeles field office on cybercrime. And, you know, that was, that was 15 years ago and so much has changed and evolved since then. And I think obviously it's, it's so important uh, to abide, you know, the fourth amendment and um, that is a, a critical facet of law enforcement. But at the same time, there is a, a need for threat intelligence, especially in law enforcement, because activity moves so quickly uh, online. It, 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 it moves and evolves at a rate that um, you can't sort of sit back and wait for the phone to ring when, when there has, you know, there's been some sort of crime, there's a victim, they call, uh, oftentimes it's it's too late, and many cyber investigations can take you know multiple years uh, before there's any sort of final disposition, before there's attribution, before there's even indictment brought. And whether that actor is domestic or international, it is a a long sort of long affair, right, in terms of these investigations. And so threat intelligence becomes so critical to the the success of law enforcement. And I saw that firsthand, you know, when I was at the Secret Service. And, and the need has only sort of accelerated. So I think if you look at, you know, what, again, the mandate is for law enforcement and just some, some basic things around, you know, physical threats, uh, obviously, you know, physical violence in the Capitol in January, um, incitements to violence, right? Those are things that law enforcement wants to be out ahead of, right? They don't want to wait reactively. And, you know, we have seen uh, some pretty significant efforts at disinformation uh, at recorded future and information operations that are generated again both domestically and internationally but if if law enforcement doesn't have availability you know to the data and they're not able to analyze that data ahead of the curve they're, they're fundamentally um, starting starting their day you know at a disadvantage and that leads to the idea of open source sources of data that they can legally and ethically avail of themselves of but when you talk about that, you're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of possible sources, maybe even more than that worldwide. So what's a good approach to being able to know where to go with respect to open source data that could augment what it is the agency has and generates on its own? Yeah, I think one of the, the interesting developments that happened recently is 
there was a lot of community building in common social media platforms, whether it was, you know, Facebook or Twitter, what, what have you. And obviously some of the self-policing that's happened recently in that area has kind of led to this dispersion of activity and discussions to new types of platforms. So Telegram, Gab, MeWe, Wimkin, CloudHub, Second First, Minds, Rumble, Signal, even IRC channels. Uh, IRC is an old internet protocol. Uh, DLive, there's all of these new sort of mobile chat applications popping up, decentralized applications popping up. And, you know, it's, it's actually making, I think, law enforcement's job that much more difficult you know, to ensure that they're they're part of these conversations, that they're on these platforms, right? To your point, where they legally can be, um, that they're again observing, you know, potential incitements to violence, um, you know, that they're potentially observing disinformation campaigns and information operations that are happening online, um, and it's more challenging than ever before for law enforcement uh, because it's not just centered in those typical platforms that you know about. Uh, it really is, you know, all over the place now. And these platforms that you mentioned, that long list, and I have to confess, I've never heard of any of them, but I guess people that want to be on them somehow find their way to their cohorts on there. How, how do you monitor those? I mean, are they something you can join and then therefore watch what's going on? Are they on the dark web? Are they on the manifest web? Where are they? How do they, how do they exist? Yeah, it's a great question. There's, and there's the way that I think about it is sort of open sources and closed sources and Open sources are platforms where anyone can join and they can take part in the conversation, they can observe the conversation. And obviously, you know, being able to collect that data over time can be useful. Um, closed sources are generally communities where some sort of vetted access is required to gain access into those communities. Uh, we track at Recorded Future, you know, a lot of different closed sources. These tend to be, you know, criminal forums, uh, marketplaces. Uh, it could also be uh, criminal communities, again, that are operating on other types of applications, you know, whether that's uh, Telegram or, or, you know, Discord or whatever it is, um, as long as, you know, we legally can be there uh, because we have an invite right, from an actor or uh, we've been given, you know, access or permission to that community, then, of course, you know, we can go in and, and collect from that community. So it's important, you know, to look at both open and closed sources and, you know, maximize your collection analysis capability, you know, within within the bounds of the law, as you stated. Yeah. So I want to make sure that we understand that point clearly, that it can be a closed source, but it is nevertheless available legally to anyone that wants to monitor it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that's the Internet cuts both ways. Right. And we I know from law enforcement, I know from experience that criminals, they, they love the internet because it provides a sense of anonymity, but that anonymity cuts both ways. And that is something that the good guys, you know, in law enforcement can really use uh, to their advantage, right? Because it's, it's very difficult to verify identity. Uh, again, the anonymity factor. And so where you're able to engage with actors in some sort of covert persona, right? It can be very beneficial uh, in terms of, you know, harvesting that information from those closed sources. Yeah. So maybe the same techniques and strategies law enforcement has used, say, to catch child predators, for example, by pretending to be someone they're not and nabbing people that way, that technique translates over to a lot of other domains then. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And obviously there's a, an entire spectrum of crimes, again, both at the, the local, state, and federal level uh, that that all translate into the cyber realm and have a cyber nexus, like you said, everything from crimes against uh, children to uh, financial crimes to, you know, uh, you know, disinformation and information operations, introducing or creating, you know, malicious code and, and kind of everything in between, selling, uh, selling firearms, selling narcotics, right? There's, there's a cyber component and nexus to almost everything now. Um, and that's not even sort of getting into the payment side of things. So it's, uh, it's definitely a challenge, but it's one that, again, we think that technology can play a, a critical role in helping to solve. And given the multiplicity of these sources, I guess that list you read was just a sample, then maybe a shortcut would be to subscribe to a recorded futures type of 
service instead of trying to figure this all out on your own. Yeah, I, I'm so fortunate to work at Recorded Future, you know, coming again from a, a background in law enforcement and the way that, you know, we produce intelligence in a product is, is just incredible. And I think it's, it's such a valuable resource uh, for our, our government partners and especially in law enforcement. I would not want to do the job again without Recorded Future just because it really is sort of the, the Bloomberg terminal of threat intelligence. And, you know, to, to be able to avail yourself to that sort of resource, uh, I would never want to go back. And just getting back to the point of the fact that people are anonymous on many of these closed and open sources, that doesn't mean they are shy. And so they feel because of the anonymity, anonymity that they can actually be much more open about what their plans are. And that's really the, the key to understanding what value this type of data might have. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, when, when you start with proactive intelligence, uh, law enforcement can take things, you know, the last mile because they have tools at their disposal. So they can, they can start with great intelligence and then they can use those tools, whether it be uh, subpoenas, whether it be search warrants, right, to further their investigations. Uh, but ultimately, they're able to, to start pulling on the thread right, and develop an investigation off of, off of quality intelligence. All right. We'll take a break on that note. My guest today is Levi Gundert. He's the Senior Vice President of Global Intelligence at Recorded Future. And I'm Tom Temin. This discussion is In Plain Sight. Use open source data to augment your threat monitoring. Sponsored by Recorded Future here on Federal News Network.